Please turn in your Bibles, if you aren't already there, to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Philippians chapter 4. And I'd like, to, I'd like to ask the Lord just to guide us one more time here before we look at His Word, that He would guide us in it and guide us into the truth. And so would you pray with me before we get started? Heavenly Father, we just come before you uh, this last time before we look at what you have written down for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Dear Lord, I just want to ask that uh, now as we look at it, that you would guide us to the truth of it. Father, I pray that you would convict us where we need convicted, that you would encourage us through it. I want to ask that you would, that, that, that your Holy Spirit would work in all of us as we Look at what you have said, that we may be changed and become more like your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here with us. We commit this time to you now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It's always, uh, it's always a challenge whenever, uh, whenever I'm asked to speak. Um, uh, it's always a challenge to know what the Lord would want, uh, would, would want me to speak whenever I get the opportunity. And uh, I just, uh, this morning, I just, well, I mean, well, before this morning, obviously, but um, as, I, as I was just praying about asking the Lord about it, he just really put something on my heart, I believe with all my heart that it was from him, something that... He's really honestly been dealing with me a lot about um, lately, a lot this year actually. Uh, This morning we're going to look at something, at a topic that is extremely practical and I believe I can say this, that it's it's something that uh, probably pretty much everybody deals with probably almost daily. Um, This morning, we're going to look together at the subject of biblical contentment. Biblical contentment. Um, And I'll just say this too, there's there's no way, there's, there's a lot that the Bible says about biblical contentment. We're not going to get close to covering near all of it this morning. Because uh, the Bible says way too much about it. But, it, but, but I do hope that what we do cover um, is life-changing and at least a good reminder to all of us uh, here this morning. Do you realize that it is God's will for, uh, for me and for you to be content? It is God's desire, it's His very desire, it's, it's, it's His command to us, really. That we have a heart attitude towards Him, towards the life that He has given us. That we have a heart attitude of contentment. In Luke chapter 3 verse 14, um, John the Baptist says, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But probably the most well-known, probably the, the most famous, if I can say it that way, passage of scripture that deals with contentment, probably the one that, 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 that pretty much everybody knows, everybody goes to when it comes to this topic of biblical contentment is where we're going to be this morning. Philippians chapter 4. In fact, you probably, if you've spent any time in church or any time in Sunday school, uh, you probably have a couple of these verses memorized from Philippians chapter 4. How many of you, let me just see, how many of you have ever memorized before uh, Philippians 4 verse 11? Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. How many of you have ever memorized that verse? Let me see your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All across the room. How about this one? Uh, two verses later, Philippians 4.13, I can do, there you go, 
All right? We, the, the, this is not a new passage of Scripture to us, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, God desires for all of us to have a heart attitude of contentment. And honestly, that's a really good statement just to, uh, just to stop and think about for a moment. Um, especially as we are in the season that we're in right now. Yeah, well, we're, we're in the holiday season. Um, New Year's is just a couple of days away. And if you're anything like me, um, I get it, like like to to I get a little emotional these days. Wh- wh- like like wh- whenever the new year is approaching, I didn't used to be like that. And then I turned thirty, and something happened. Um, but but whenever New Year rolls around, like I really have I I have a tendency to look back on it and to think about stuff. Think about things like I wanted to do this and I didn't get to. Um, I had this goal this year and I wasn't able to get to it or, 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 or it couldn't happen for me. Things like that. Um, it's good for me to be reminded of these things as I enter this new year. Um, we just had Christmas a couple of days ago. Um, some of you are really happy. Others of you are thinking, it would have been really nice if the person buying my gift would have read my mind a little bit better. Before they, before they just went out, right? And I'm not confessing, by the way, all right? I, 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 yeah, I better throw that in there. Um, no, I, I, I had a fine Christmas. I uh, made out okay. Uh, my brother Michael drew my name, so everything was fine. Um, if somebody else would have drawn it, it may have not been so fine. But anyway, they, that's neither here. And anyway, um, got carried away there. Um, but... The point of the matter is, you understand where we're going here, okay? The point of the matter is, we are all going to face circumstances. We are all going to face situations regularly that we have no control over, that we didn't ask for necessarily, but we have no, we, we, we have no power to do anything about them. We have absolutely no control to change them in any single way whatsoever. And when we face those situations, it is God's will for us to face them with, an, with a heart attitude of being content when they're here. That's God's will for each and every one of us. Now, this thing called contentment, for me anyway, um, out of all the sins that I deal with, out of, all the, out of all the things that I struggle with in my own life, this is probably one of the ones, in fact, maybe the one that, is just, that, that, that just slips through my fingers so quickly and so easily. Um, it doesn't make any sense a lot of times. Uh, it, 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 you know, to me, it seems like one of those things that I should be just be able to do. Um, I should just be able to, 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 to just buck up and be this way, but it slips through my fingers so quickly and so easily. Um, and it, 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 in fact, this just happened yesterday. Um, I was in here. Uh, somebody came into the church. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but somebody came into the church and they, they, they caught me practicing for, for today, uh, we, which is always embarrassing. Um, uh, he, yeah, I have to practice because I'm not good enough not to, okay? But, um, but, but he, he, he heard a lot of yelling going on. He thought I was reading somebody the riot act. Um, <laughs> and so he came to make sure everybody, it, like, it, like everything was all right. And I was reading it to myself, he found out. And, um, and he asked, he said, what, what's tomorrow's sermon going to be on? And I said, well, we're going to go over what, what it is to be biblically content. First words out of his mouth were, man, that's a hard thing to do. First thing out of his mouth. And he's right. He's right about that. Because what you find as you study God's word is whenever it comes to being biblically content, as you study God's word and what he has to say about it, you find this out, that it actually has very little to do with me and what I can do in my own power. And believe it or not, it's got virtually everything to do with God and what God can do. And, and, and just as importantly, my personal relationship as a child of God with God. That's what it has virtually everything to do with. Point number one today, if you want to take notes, 
is contentment comes from having the right view of God and the right view of self. That's where we're going to start. Can, biblical contentment comes from having the right view of God and the right view of self. I want to, <clears throat> we're going to go from our passage just a couple of pages for a moment. I'd like for you to turn to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1 just for a moment. And we're going to come right back. But contentment will come from having the right view of God and the right view of self. Let me define this word content quickly for us. It comes from the Greek word autarkes. And it literally means self-sufficient. Now, don't let that throw you off, okay? I know we just talked about how, how, how it's got everything to do with God and my relationship with God. The word literally means self-sufficient, and I promise it will make sense as we unpack this, okay? But that's literally what the word means. Self-sufficient. Satisfied. It's the attitude, literally the attitude of, of saying, I have enough. I have enough. I don't need anything else. I have enough. And, and, when, and, and, when different, and, and, and it's that attitude in spite of whatever circumstance I find myself in. Whatever circumstance I'm in, whatever situation I'm in that, that is not favorable to me, um, is giving me problems, is just not where I want to be, is making life hard for me, whatever that is, the, 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 the attitude of contentment does not have to be controlled by that. It's literally outside of it. In spite of circumstances. But it's important for us to understand that the start of contentment is having a right view of myself and having a right view of God. Look with me down there at Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. Because I want us to see that the Apostle Paul had the right view of himself. And the Apostle Paul had the right view of God. And this is important for us to get as we get into this topic this morning. Philippians chapter 1 verse number 1. Follow along with me. Paul and Timothy. <coughs> servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. I want to just focus on the first part of this verse. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now that's the introduction. That's the first words that come to the Apostle Paul's mind as he starts to write this letter to the Philippians. As he introduces himself, this is the first thing that comes to his mind. I need to introduce myself to you, and I'm going to introduce myself this way. Now, not exactly how, if I had an opportunity to introduce myself to a group of people, not exactly the first thing that pops into my mind, just to be honest. That, hi, my name's Aaron Huffman, I am a servant. Does that cross your mind? And yet, that's the first thing that the Apostle Paul wants these people to understand about him. And the word for servant here, and most of you probably know this, is the Greek word doulos, which literally means slave. He introduces himself literally by saying, I am the slave of Christ Jesus. What does he mean by that? He, he means I am totally 100% committed to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He has every right to do with me whatever he wants to do. He has every right to send me wherever he wants me to go. He has every right to put me through whatever it is that he wants to put me through. I belong to him. He is my master. That's literally what he's saying here. He is my master. I belong to him. The Apostle Paul understood something. He understood something that I have trouble with a lot. See, I naturally, because I think I am something so much of the time, I naturally have thoughts like this. Man, I deserve stuff. Man, I do this, I do this, I do that. I deserve stuff. I deserve something. 
Or I have rights. Has that ever crossed your mind? I have the right to this. Man, look what I've done. I have the right to this. I have the right to that. That's kind of naturally my thought process. Not the Apostle Paul's thought process. Slaves don't have rights. And slaves don't deserve stuff. And Paul says, this is who I am. Paul understood something. Paul understood that the only thing he deserved because he was a sinner, here is his, here's, here's his view of himself right here. I am a sinner. The only thing I rightfully deserved was separation from God because of that. If I would have gotten what I deserved, that's what it would have been. Separation from God in hell, but I had a God who loved me too much to, let, to, to give me what I rightfully deserved. I have a God who because of love and grace came down and rescued me from what I truly deserved and gave to me, there's the key word, and gave to me eternal life and a place with Him and joy everlasting in His presence. That is what He has given to me. And I am totally, 100% committed to Him now. He owns me. He, he, he has my life. I am His servant because of everything that He has done for me and given to me. I am 100% committed to Him. And He can do with me what He likes. He can give me what He likes. He can take from me what He likes. I know that He will always do what is best for me. He is my Savior. And thank God we have the Master we do. Paul understood, I don't deserve anything. I don't, de I, I don't have rights. I'm the servant of the Lord and nothing more. A sinner in need of a Savior. That was the Apostle Paul's view of himself and his view of his God. And when you have that view, all of a sudden it becomes maybe slightly easier to have this hard attitude of it's enough. It's sufficient. I don't need anything more. Whatever situation I'm in, wherever I am, in circumstances that I cannot control, in places that I never thought I would be and I do not want to be, I don't need anything. I am content. I don't need more. This is the attitude. This is where it starts. We have a God who loves us and gave himself for us. That's who he is. For sinners like me, that's who I am. So important to have the correct view of God and self as we go into this. Turn back, if you would please, to our passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse number 10. And before we read it, let me just give you the context of what's going on here. Um, the Apostle Paul obviously is writing this letter to the Philippians through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, he, he's in prison at this time. The Philippians found out that Paul was in prison, that he was in need, and they decided to send him a gift. That's what's going on. Now, we don't know exactly what the gift is. The Bible doesn't go into detail of what it was. We can take a pretty good guess. Um, because in verse number, I believe it's verse number 18. Uh, yeah. Verse number 18, the Apostle Paul says to them, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, he says. So we can take a pretty good guess that it probably had something uh, to, to do financially. Probably money. Uh, maybe food. Uh, things like that along those lines. We can probably take a pretty good guess on that. That's probably, probably the, the kind of thing that they were sending him. Um, but in verses 10, basically through 18, and even verse 20, it's basically the Apostle Paul saying thank you. Um, he's starting to wrap up the letter, and he wants to make sure that he uh, lets them know that he's full of gratitude, and he's thankful for what they have done for him. Uh, meeting his needs in his time of need while he was there in prison. So, that's the context of what's going on. So, so with that being said, look with me in verse number 10 um, and following. Here we go. Point number two this morning. A content person is willing to wait on the Lord. 
A content person is willing to wait on the Lord, starting in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now, take a look at this with me. Um, the, this, this, the, this hit me kind of funny um, as I was studying it this week. Um, it's, it's not wrong. What the Apostle Paul says here obviously is not a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't say anything that he shouldn't have. Obviously, he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is writing this through his pen. Um, but, but I couldn't help but notice this. Um, he, he says something, and then he's got to go on and give a little clarification. Have you ever done that? Um, that that's literally what yes, some of you guys are saying. Yes, I have done that. Um, and here's, here's, here's what he says. Now, this is him saying thank you. This is him starting to say thank you, basically. Um, here it is. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length, and another way you could translate that is that uh, that word length is at last, that now at last, finally, you could kind of say, finally, you have revived your concern for me. And that word revive right there carries the idea of, of a flower that has bloomed and then has closed up again. And, and is now re-blooming. So in other words, it almost, sounds like, it almost sounds like he's saying to the Philippians, okay, you guys have cared about me before, and they have, by the way. You can read that. I believe it's in verses 15 and 16 here of our text. Um, you guys have cared about me before, and, and then it seemed like you didn't care about me anymore for quite a period of time, and now your care for me has blossomed again. Okay, all right? That's almost what it seems like he's saying. It's not, qu- it's, it's not what he's saying, and he's going to give a little clarification here, here, here in the next sentence. I did this, by the way, just the other week. Um, I uh, said something that just came out completely wrong. Um, I, most of you know my five-year-old, Casey. Um, I, fun fact about me, I have always thought her blonde hair was so cute. Um, you know, little cute blonde girl running around. I've just always kind of liked her blonde hair, and... Um, the, the other week I, she was, she was there, we were eating dinner, I think, and I just, I noticed, and my eyes could have been playing tricks on me, I don't know, but it looked to me like her hair was starting to darken a little bit, and now, I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me, or if it's the winter time, so she's inside, sunlight's not lightening it, um, as much anymore, or if it really is starting to turn, um, I don't know, but I just thought I noticed it, and I said something that I completely did not mean, um, I said, I said, uh, oh, Casey, is your hair going to turn dark like your mommy's? Now, I didn't, yeah, 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 listen to you, okay? And I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like that at all, but I wasn't quick enough. Um, and <clears throat> my wife heard me. She spun around and she said this, is there a problem with that? <laughs> and I said, No. I didn't mean it like that. She said, well, what exactly did you mean? That's what she said. <laughs> and I had a chance at that point. It didn't really go very well, but I had a chance to try and clarify what I was saying. All right. That, that's, that's more something like we have here, okay? Um, the Apostle Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Now we have the clarification. Okay, looky here. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. In other words, listen, don't, don't get me wrong here, okay? All right. All right, all right. Um, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that after a while, you have again revived your concern for me. Um, you, not that you weren't concerned for me. You were indeed concerned for me. I'm not saying you weren't through this length of time here, okay? But you had no opportunity. You just didn't have an opportunity to help me. All right? That's what this is. It's not that you didn't care about me. I understand that. It's just you didn't have an opportunity, and that's all. Let, let me ask you a question. Re, remember, a content person is willing to wait on the Lord. Has it ever crossed your mind, my mind, 
as we are going through unfavorable circumstances, the way the Apostle Paul was during this time, being in prison, probably not the best living conditions, was facing death, didn't know what was going to happen. As he's facing this, and as we are facing circumstances regularly that are not what we would call ideal, has this thought ever crossed your mind? That God knows better than me. God knows better than me. If you're anything like me, I want God to step in and change it now. Because I don't like it. It's not fun. It's not fun for me. It's making life difficult for me. And I want it changed right now. And has it ever occurred to us that God knows better than me? Does it occur to me that this is the all-powerful, sovereign God who perfectly loves me? I can pillow my head every single night and say to myself, I am perfectly loved by a perfect God who does everything perfectly, who does everything according to the counsel of His will, who works all things together for the ultimate good of those who love Him, who is in the business, listen to this, who is in the business of maturing people and changing people through trials, according to James chapter 1. God, you know better than me. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul is saying, listen to me, guys. Yeah, I've been in need. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. And I know that it's not that you forgot about me. You would have, you, 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 you've cared about me all along, but you didn't have an opportunity. The fact of the matter is, if God wanted you to help me before this, he could have easily given you an opportunity, but he didn't give you one. God is sovereign, God's in control. would have been nothing for him to provide an opportunity, but he didn't do it. Because he wasn't done yet. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's best for me. Be content. Be content. Lord, I don't need anything. It's enough. It's sufficient. You know what we're doing? You know what you're doing? I'll let you work. And I will choose to be content as I go through this situation that I have no control over. That's it. And right before we go to our final point, I just think it's important for all of us to understand just how far this really goes. Because <laughs> this is really interesting. How far does God expect me to take this, con the, this, this whole contentment thing? What is contentment to God? What is contentment in the eyes of God? What do I need to be content with? And just very quickly, I'm not going to ask you to turn there... Do for, for, for sake of time, but, let, but, but, but listen to these words, okay? I'm going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, okay? Now listen to the words that God has written down here. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content but if we have food and clothing with these we will be content in the eyes of God what does he expect us to be content with you have to move your lips to talk <laughs> sorry it got awkward there in the eyes of God what does he expect us to be content with Food and clothing. And, 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 and what's another name for that, by the way? Food and clothing starts with a B. What's, what, what, what's another name for that? Basics. Thank you, Sarah. 
basic needs. He says, with food and clothing, with these you will be content. The, the basics of life. Let me ask you a question. How many of you got up this morning and before you came to church, you had breakfast? Let me see your hands. How many of you had breakfast? Okay, put your hands down. Those of you that didn't raise your hands, put your hand up if you didn't have breakfast, but it was by choice that you did not have breakfast. Thank you very much. And by the way, you shouldn't do that. It's not good for you. Anyway, um, <coughs> Excuse me. How many of you over the Christmas holiday, you would say that you had more than enough and, and you ate more than you probably should have? Would you be willing to raise your hand on that one? Okay. Yeah, you know what? Okay, me too. I got both of them right up here. All right. I'm going to be a part of this. Now, this is, <laughs> this is maybe more of a dumb question, but the text begs me to ask it. Okay. How many of you came to church this morning and you have clothes on right now? And I better see every hand go up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We have clothes on. We have clothes to keep to, to wear, to cover ourselves, to keep us warm. All right. How many of you here? Wait, wait, wait. no, no, no. Here's here's one for you teenage girls and you college age girls. Um, how many of you raise your hand and don't lie to me? How many of you have enough changes of clothes that you could go through the whole semester and not wear the same clothing twice? Thank you. Ma'am, I'm not going to say everybody what your name is, but that was very, very kind of you. Um, how, how many of us came to church today with shoes on our feet? Or what you women call shoes. I don't think they are really, but what you women call shoes. No, honestly, I don't get it. I really don't get it sometimes. My wife will go out to a party, a, a good party, and... <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm not there, so what would I know? But <laughs> she'll go to a party or she'll come here to church with, her, uh, with, uh, with these things that you ladies call shoes. And she will come back after being out. And one of you ladies tell me, because, be, 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 because you all know what the answer to this is. She comes back in and she says, she says something and she does something immediately the minute she walks in the door. What does she say? She says something first, ladies. What does she say? My feet are killing me, right? And then she takes her shoes off immediately. And I'm standing there, like this has nothing to do with the message really, but, but, I, but I'm standing there and I'm like, why? Why would you do that? And that's another thing, because the only answer I've ever gotten, by the way, but you know, whenever I've asked that question is this. This is basically the only answer I've ever gotten. Hey, uh, you won't understand and you wouldn't make it as a woman. <laughs> to which I say you got that right. That's why God didn't make me one. All right, now that's funny. All right, and let's get serious for a second. Church family, what do we have to be discontent about? Do we have a place to be discontent? God says, if you have food and clothing with these, you shall be content. You have some food in your stomach? Oh, you have clothes on to keep you warm? Do your children? With these, you shall be content. With these, you should say, it's enough. I don't need anything. God, you don't owe me anything. You've given me everything. You don't owe me anything. I have no rights. I don't deserve anything. I'm content. That's how far it goes. Our last point this morning, number three, is the secret of biblical contentment. The secret of biblical contentment. If you're like me as we've been talking about this, I'm, like, I'm already tempted to just say, I can do that. I can do that. What's so hard about it? I can do it. 
But remember what we've said up until now. And this is where we're going right now. There's a secret to this. And the secret is not me. And my strength. Probably called a secret because that's where I go. All the time. But God says, no, no. There's a part to this that you need to understand. This thing we call biblical contentment. Look with me in verse 11 and following. He says, not that, I, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here's what he's saying. There are circumstances that are going to come to you regularly that you have no control over, that you didn't ask for, that you have no ability to change or to get out of and can do nothing about them literally. And when, the, and when this happens, there's a secret that you've got to know if you desire to be content as you go through these things. If you desire to have the attitude of God, I am just your humble servant. That's who I am. I'm a sinner who you have saved by your grace. By your precious blood, fully out of love and grace. This is who I am. That is who you are. The all-powerful God. I serve you. I love you. You have every right to do with me exactly what you want. And I know that, it, that everything you do is good. It is for my good. Here I am. And I don't need anything other than what you allow. There's a secret to this. In these verses, Paul uses the phrase, I have learned, twice. This phrase, I have learned. Now that gives it away right there, what I naturally go to. It gives away the fact that what I naturally go to is not the way. You know, the whole thing, I'm just going to rise up and decide to do this. Paul says, no, I have had to learn this. I've had to learn this. And it can be learned, by the way, because the Apostle Paul doesn't say here, I am learning this. He says, I have learned. Not perfectly, not entirely. Paul was always a sinner, and the Lord had him write this down, but not perfectly, not entirely, but for the most part, I have learned this. I've had to learn this. And it's interesting that the Apostle Paul goes into real life circumstances here. And by the way, you can read about these in detail in 2 Corinthians. Where Paul just gives a whole list of all kinds of things that his life consisted of that the Lord allowed him to go through. But Paul gives some real life circumstances here which gives away the fact that he probably did not learn this by sitting in the classroom. And being instructed of how to do this. All right? He more than likely, more, 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 more than likely learned this by what you businessmen would call on the job training, basically. The school of hard knocks, you could say. That's how he learned this. He goes into some things that he has literally been through. Here we go. And by the way, he didn't try to change anything. What he couldn't change, he didn't change. And he learned to be content. Here we go. And he says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, he says. I know how to be brought low. That means to be living in poverty or to be poor. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, I've been here. I have literally been here. I know exactly what it's like to live in poverty and to be poor. I know exactly what that's like. I've been there. <laughs> Let's go on. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. That means to have more than enough. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, I've been on both ends of these things. 
I've been on both ends here. I know exactly what it's like to be living in poverty and to be a poor person. I know exactly what that's all about. I've been there. I also know exactly what it's like. There's been occasions when the Lord has directed my circumstances to where I have also been on the abounding side of things, where I have had more than enough. All right? I've been at both places. I know exactly what both of them are all about. I've been there. I've lived them. And the bottom line is I have learned through my experiences that the Lord has allowed me to go through, I have learned to be content. I have learned it. I've been there. I have learned it. Here we go. Let's keep going. He says, I have learned. Let me find my place. I, have been, I, I, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, in, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty. I've learned the secret of facing plenty. That means to have more than enough to eat. He says, I know exactly what it's like to sit down at a good meal where there's more than enough to go around. I know exactly what that's like. I've learned the secret of facing plenty. I have learned the secret of facing hunger, he says. I also know what it's like to not have enough food to eat. I've been there. I know exactly what it's like to have way too much and to probably eat way too much. I, know, I also know exactly what it's like to not have enough. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians where he says, often without food, in hunger. When he talks about his own experiences, he says, I've been there. I'm not telling you anything that I haven't been there. And he says, I have learned that in each and every one of these circumstances, some of you are probably thinking what I, what I enjoy to think. Think, you know, well, well, I mean, if I have to learn to be content in each and every situation, and that includes the bountiful, and that includes having more than enough, sign me up for that right there. Because I would like to learn to be content in stuff like that. All right? And we know that that's, and, and we know that a lot of stuff doesn't bring contentment, right? We know that. We see that lived out in front of us all the time. We see that in our own lives, don't we? Things do not bring contentment. No matter how little we have or how much we have. That's the lesson here. He says, I've been at each spot. I've been poor. I've lived bountifully. I've had more than enough to eat. I've had not enough to eat. I've been everywhere. And I have learned through these things that God has allowed me to go through. Circumstances that I could not change. I have learned to have the attitude, I'm a humble servant of Christ. He doesn't owe me anything. He doesn't, I don't deserve anything. I don't have any rights. I'm a sinner that he is saved by his grace. And it is enough. In each and every circumstance, no matter what it is, it is enough. What he has given to me, what he has allowed, it is enough. What's the secret Paul's talking about? How did he learn to be like this? Verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many of you have heard that verse about all kinds of things? You know? I have a test that I haven't studied for, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? <laughs> no. No. But that's not the context of what he's talking about here. He's talking about being content. Having this hard attitude. The only way to do it, the only way to learn to be this kind of individual that God wants each and every one of us to be is simply this. Through him. I am powerless to do this on my own. Through him. He 
He gives me everything that I need and all the power I need to learn to be this man. A man that says, I'm the servant of the Lord God. I'm a sinner. He saved me. He's the all-powerful, loving God who gave me life. I'm his and his alone. He has given me everything that I need. And it's enough. No matter what it is that I face, it is enough. And I don't need anything else else other than what he gives and what he allows that's the secret of biblical contentment God do you have this kind of relationship with God where you understand who you are you understand who he is you understand that he has given you everything And in whatever situation you find yourself, you find his strength making you capable of being content. Is that the relationship that you have with God? Would you please bow your heads as we close this morning? And I'd like to ask for a piano player to come up and begin to play as we close. We have flown through this this morning. And I just want to have, and and, and I just have a question. I have a couple questions I want to ask. Number one, number one, do you know this God? Do you have a relationship with him? That's question number one. For without the saving relationship with God, and eternal life that he gives us, and becoming his child, you will never be content. Do you know him as your savior? Do you understand what he's done for you? Secondly, is has God pointed out anything in your life this morning that you are not content with? That you, that you know you have not pulled on to his power and leaned on his power to be content. Is there something like that in your life? What is it that you are discontent with? I would like, just as the piano plays, I would like just to give you a moment to talk with the Lord if you need to. Just silently there in your spot, talk with the Lord. Admit to him where you have been discontent. Where it hasn't been enough for you. With whatever situation you're facing, you have the, you've had the attitude of, I deserve more, I have a right to more, I deserve more than this. And it has not been enough. Would you make that right with him, right where you sit?
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have met here with us today. Thank you so much for the teaching of your word and what you teach us that it's such a challenge for me, such a challenge for me that contentment is not found in what I have. It's found in you. Thank you so much for giving all of us the strength to live the way you have called us to live. We thank you and praise you in your most precious name. Amen.